Um, parents, the onus, Tomas says, should be on the parents and on teachers. Do you agree? I do agree. I do think, though, that working parents get blamed for everything. And I do believe that children of a certain age know that if they go to the shop and buy crisps and chocolate, that it's not going to have a good effect on them. They're going to put on weight and they're going to, you know, have fillings. Unless they're living in a cave, they're aware that sugar is bad for them. So what I age do, do you think they have that, that I mean, knowledge? I think from age upwards, you know, and from personal experience, I, I think from age upwards. Um, now, I do think, obviously, parents have to be responsible for what goes into their lunch boxes and, and all of that. But I think the key here is education, but it's also empowerment. And I really believe that a great way to help would be to introduce cookery, course, cookery courses in uh, school, probably first year, I think. I mean, transition year is the obvious year to do it, but I think certainly 13, 12, 13 kids should learn how to cook their own meals. And children love to be independent. They love doing things for themselves. So if you could teach them maybe even four decent recipes over the year, and then they could come home and cook, and wouldn't that be wonderful to come home from work and have a meal put in front of you? Okay, well, we've lots of, of raised hands here. I think right beside you there we have a, a, a teacher. Do you agree with that, that home ec and, and cooking should be uh, compulsory, just right beside Sinead? Um, no, I don't actually, because one of, one of the infrastructural difficulties in second level schools is the overloaded curriculum. Take, for example, the subject specification for PE is two hours a week. I would say there is not a student in the country who gets two hours a week PE. So we can't cope because, with what we should be doing exactly. at the moment. And we don't have the infrastructure. There's a, <coughs> it's well known that information on its own is not a good and effective method of health promotion. It needs to be enhanced and supported with uh, structural issues. What do you think of what Tomás O'Shea does? He has a look in their lunch boxes. He talks okay. them through what they're bringing in. Is that feasible, something that we could roll out in schools? In second level schools, I would think that would be totally inappropriate. We are talking about building young adults <coughs> and getting them to be responsible. At what's appropriate at a primary school level, is not necessarily appropriate at a second level school. What I would like to say about second level schools is that actually the work that has been done and huge amounts of work being done in promoting a healthy lifestyle is done not because of the government departments but in spite of them. Take for example extracurricular activities. Now there's a huge, huge variety of sports that are played in the vast majority of schools despite a deficit of infrastructure such as gyms. Our own but surely, but surely now it's time to take drastic action. You saw the statistics there in Tomas's report. Absolutely. Let me take But you're saying it's, it's not, it's not no, feasible no. to go through lunchboxes and so on. No, no, I'm talking about, let's talk about the, the PE. No, it's not. I don't think it's inappropriate to go through lunchboxes. But let's look at the PE. I come from a school that after, I'm there 32 years. This year is the first year that we have a gym. A gym after 32 years. So you need infrastructure. So that's the infrastructure thing. Okay, I want yeah. to come to, to the lady beside you now and then we'll, I'll come to you behind. Yeah. Um, well, I'm, I have to completely disagree. I'm a home economics teacher from St. Clair's Comprehensive in Manor Hamilton County Leitrim. And I'm also a member of the Association of Home Economics Teachers Ireland. And I am seeing what cooking is doing for students and their food choices. And my best representatives of that are here, Alfie and Ava, two Leave and Search students. And what I find is that children, when children are given and students are given the opportunity to cook and apply these nutritional skills, they need to apply their knowledge for really it to go into the students' heads. So you, are you on the side of compulsory home ec? Compulsory home ec for life skills. Like I see an example is that I provide, students are given the opportunity in home ec to produce dishes on a budget. Sometimes I give them a budget of say 10 euro and they produce nutritious balanced dishes. Like they get to see okay. chicken curry homemade and I go around like many home ec teachers yeah. and I asked them why I have to pick this dish and they are applying their knowledge they're telling me right I picked barn rice miss because fibre it's good for preventing so constipation nutrition. or diarrhoea you, I see you with your hand raised again what are you to say about that? Yeah as I said I, I'm not saying that uh, skills shouldn't be taught but as making it a compulsory subject I would disagree with that I want to come in here in terms of schools that are allocated as DESH schools we know that the problem with obesity and overweight is increased if you are from certain <coughs> socioeconomic groups. Now, poorer, so, if you're poorer. If you're poorer, okay. Now, if you are a dis... Because it's the people that are disadvantaged. The families are disadvantaged, not the schools. But particularly in rural Ireland, if you are from a, a, a school that does not have disadvantaged status, then you don't have any of the you support structures. You don't get any of the supports. Okay, I want Absolutely. to get lots of people in. Which is a really quick point on yeah. cookery. Um, in Japan, they have a very, very, very low obesity problem. 
because cooking is compulsory in schools and so it does work. It's been proven to work so I think it would be great if we could introduce it. Okay and the lady behind there, I just want to come to you and then we'll come to our panel. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm a home economics teacher as well in Loretto Secondary School in Balbriggan, winner of the BT Young Scientist 2016. Um, we have 1,250 girls. They, the girls take uh, junior cert home economics and then they have a choice to take it to leaving cert. I don't necessarily agree that it should be compulsory. I think it's a much wider issue. I think we have to involve the community and we have to involve the parents as well. And that's what we're doing in our school in Balbriggan. We're involving the community. We have our local okay. supermarket, Super Value, on board. We're doing All lots right. of initiatives at community level. What? And I think when you address it at community level, it seeps into the parents and ultimately into the students. All right. Um, Cathy Monaghan. Cathy, you are a dietitian I'm here. You've got pediatric dietitian. Okay, now there are lots of uh, ramifications that come from unhealthy eating, but one of them is diabetes. Tell us what you are seeing. Well, I mainly deal with children with type 1 diabetes, so really they shouldn't have the same name, but uh, the type 1 diabetes is not caused by diet, but type 2 diabetes is the consequences of uh, being overweight or um, unhealthy lifestyle. Okay. So it's not where we are now, it's where we're headed. In the US at the, the moment, 50% of newly diagnosed type 2 diabetics are in the adolescent, or the adolescent age group. This would tip, typically have been in the over 40 age group. So why, so why is it happening? Um, a number of reasons, like everyone has said already, but I think we have to start at the very beginning. It starts, we need to educate, we need dietitians to, to start educating uh, parents before they before they become parents it's the importance of breastfeeding it's also the importance of weaning so we know that 20% uh, of kids or babies are weaned on to solids before before four months never mind before six months so 20% of babies are on solids before four months okay? and that leads that to can increases lead the risk to of being overweight obese. having type 2 diabetes also commercial baby foods so this is a pouch that's marketed for four months old it's organic it's wholesome it's home cooked home taste etc uh, yet it contains 17 grams of sugar. So this is what 17 grams of sugar looks like for a four-month-old baby. I think, okay? I mean, you were showing us that just before we came to air, and I was really taken aback, yeah. very, so very shocked. I think people will be at home. This, this is above the recommended in a whole day for a five-year-old, but this is for one meal for one four-month-old. So, you know, there's plenty of 12-week-old babies even who are having three of these a day. What hope have we have got to get these kids to eat fruit, veg, um, protein, you know, plain protein, when they think a meal should taste this sweet. This we have sweet, to start yeah. from the very beginning with weaning, breastfeeding, from, you know, parenthood well, needs what to come are your, with a commercial What are your thoughts morning. on a sugar tax then? Uh, a sugar tax, uh, I agree with the principle, but I think then it, it uh, pushes it back onto the parents. But I think certain products shouldn't exist. Sh certain sugary breakfast cereals shouldn't exist. I think supermarkets perhaps we know how they're designed to get people to buy more but maybe we need to use that for public health advantage to change how supermarkets are uh, laid out so that um, all the high sugar unhealthy stuff is in the junk aisle I also think we need to stop calling treats 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 should be magazines we're all guilty of that yeah so it, it's their junk okay it's you're not you, you know you're not having any more junk you're going to a party at the weekend it's no more junk it's not treats they're junk Okay, you know, they're it's junk. Well, look, we'll, I know we've got lots of people who want to come in, but I want to bring our panel in now and then we'll come back to you. We have Marcella Corkman Kennedy, who is Minister with Responsibility for Health Promotion, and Dr. Ava Orsman, who uh, you will probably know very well. Um, Dr. Ava, I would come to you first. How bad is the type 2 diabetes problem in Ireland? I mean, it's horrendous. I mean, we are spending 1.3 billion, which is 10% of the health budget, on the treatment of the symptoms of a disease that is actually largely self-inflicted. It's a, it's, a, it's a lifestyle disease which people, the person who has type 2 diabetic is typically overweight or obese and they typically have the weight in the middle. So we're talking about the, the basically the metabolic, you know, the fat in the middle which is basically metabolically active fat that creates these inflammatory hormones that don't only create type 2 diabetes but are also responsible for cancers. So now we are treating Type 2 diabetes in, in this country, mainly the first call for doctors is to give metformin and drugs, where we should actually start promoting people and say, Mer Mary, what is your lifestyle? Why you are carrying this that. excess I weight? I want to talk to you about the treatment in just loss. a moment, but we, we just touched on the sugar tax, and I want to know whether you think a sugar tax might have any sort of impact on our diabetes rates, type 2 diabetes rates. First of all, Obesity is created by many factors. 
And while I am delighted of the, the feedback we got for the Sugar Crash program, and it's absolutely wonderful to see initiatives like this, you know, the, really the thing is that let's not do the same mistake we did before, that we actually started to blame fat. And now we're going to say it's the sugar. It's not just only sugar. I like to eat sugar. I like chocolate. I want to eat the things when I want to eat it. But it's a balance. Sugar is everywhere hidden, but it's not only sugar that's the problem. It's the excess energy that we're having. And remember also, Claire, that all the starchy carbohydrates are turning to sugar in your body. Also, fructose is in fruit. So if you eat too much fruit, that's also turned to sugar. So it's not right to demonize sugar then? Absolutely not. And, and when they're talking about sugar, crash, sugar tax, they're actually talking about fizzy drink tax. That's what, what they're talking about. They can't, you know, uh, uh, the children who drink too much uh, apple juice and orange juice. So how can they, uh, they're going to tax that as well? So really that is again another tax. Really we need to go the education way. We need to start, I absolutely agree with that. We need to start educating people to cook from the beginning, and I, what annoys me, really irritates me, that we, we keep talking about exercise. When we're talking about obesity, let's stop talking about exercise, because it's actually the diet that makes us okay. overweight and obese. Minister, because the, somebody who yeah. is overweight and obese cannot exercise their weight off. So really, let's so stop. About, we have to go back, lifestyle. because this is how we are going to take okay. emphasis just, off uh, all right. the food. I'll come back so to that you. let's just talk exercise and, and forget and about it. And I'll come food. back to you in a moment. The sugar tax is a waste of time, but it's coming. This government wants it in 2018, Marcella. Yes, it's one of the tools, I suppose, that we're going to use to tackle the obesity problem. Waste of time, uh, says well, the expert. It, well, it's, well, I know she's an expert in taxation. Uh, uh, as far as we're concerned, it's one of the tools that we're going to use. Um, and the idea being that the Department of uh, Finance will be looking at the best uh, type of tax, how much it will be. Remember this, if a child drinks uh, one can of sugary drink or a sugar sweetened drink, I mean, uh, they, they, over a year and a half, they will gain a kilo without uh, doing anything else. So we have to tackle it. And it, as it's I say, not it's, stop it's one. Them drinking it will just be a little well, it's, bit more. One, it's, it's two one cents of extra them. on one can of fizzy drink is going to stop people to drink well, fizzy if, drinks. Well, if, 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 if that was all that they were drinking, but the, the difficulty and is that... And what about all the bread and the potatoes and excessive portions of things? Sorry, we need to, we actually have to stop looking at one thing. This is, this is not getting anywhere. It's education. Well, it's can starting I ask you, to wake Dr. children Eva, at schools and actually making aware. Have you, have you read our national obesity plan? And actually, I have looked at it and it's well, a, you, very it's difficult to understand anything. It's of not it. that was a bit difficult. There are ten, difficult. ten simple steps. I have it here. I'll give it to you afterwards. Very good. There are ten simple think. steps. Um, a, a number of them would be involve calorie posting, for example, uh, looking at advertising uh, on television. I mean, a child, preschool child, you won't believe it, will have seen a thousand uh, ads for junk food. Uh, by the time they're young, you know, we have to it's, actually it's look at the mothers before so at they the fall end of pregnant. The day, uh, we need to. We, we, the, the, the obesity problem we have is multifaceted, and so we have to tackle it on a lot of different levels. So what we do have you think, to have Marcella, a whole of the, society. The suggestion we had from some of our teachers that home economics should be compulsory; that children should not be going through second level in particular without knowing about uh, nutrition and how to cook. Mm. Very basic cooking very good suggestions and in fact I taught my own children how to cook as well. Uh, the, the, the point is that um we well, have some, to, we have some to mothers won't do so that, so do we need to have that? that. And we, certainly, we, yes, subject. we will certainly be looking at that. For example, the Department of Education uh, is going to introduce a wellness subject for the junior cycle, which I think will encompass everything. It'll be including diet, it'll include uh, mental health, it'll include physical activity. So it's going to be a broad approach. Obesity is not the preserve of the Department of Health to solve. All of us across society have to approach it. I totally agree with the lady who said it's about the individual, it's about the family, it's about community. And we have to take a broad approach. For example, we had the uh, National Activity Plan was launched earlier this year. There's a wonderful website called Get Ireland Active. Again, you go I. with the exercise. But we sorry, must we have need some to exercise. On exercise food here. As we're we're looking need at, to stop this exercise we're looking business. At, I really wish you'd stop interrupting me. I didn't interrupt you at all. Uh, we need to look at a full approach to this. Exercise is very good for your mental health. And if your mental health is better, and your you're mental better, health is not good if you're overweight you'll be, you'll be or a, obese. You'll be in a better place if you're, if you're exercising. I'm not saying that uh, uh, exercise there is the a, only there solution. There was a study in Sweden that found is, that become, an obese person's quality of life is worse than a terminal cancer patient. Absolutely. And of course, that goes with mental health. 
problems. Look, an and obese person somebody, cannot you're exercise. You're talking to somebody who's obese, Dr. Ava. I know exactly what should be done and shouldn't be done. But then, and the government are approaching this in a whole of society approach. So yes. You will, of course, have to tackle uh, diet. I mean, it's quite clear. Portion size. I mean, if you look at what Safe Food Ireland are doing at the moment in terms of advising families to give children small portions sorry, we are talking rather than about large food portions. Yeah, but, okay. sorry, but the food we are looking at reformulation. Totally wrong, Ava, Marcel, I want to come back to, be, to diabetes. All right? Yeah, but when if I could just, I need, I just to address this point because I've been interrupted constantly. And I really want to talk about type 2 diabetes. And we are going to talk about that. If you just let her finish, we'll talk about it. You mentioned the food pyramid. Uh, the healthy eating guidelines are being revised and we're actually launching a revised food pyramid where we're moving Delighted. fruit and vegetables to the bottom level and moving carbohydrate up. So okay. it is One actually being revised. One level is not okay. enough. It should go two we, levels at least. Well, because we want to talk about diabetes now. We'll we have, have the President of Diabetes Ireland uh, with us now, Professor Gerald Tomkin. Just raise your hand, Gerald, so we can get a, a microphone to you. You're very welcome to the programme. You heard Dr. Ava saying there that the way to deal with this is through diet and to address the lifestyle issues. Do you agree? No. <laughs> Sorry. But, I mean, you're you're so a medication man, is that right? Sorry? You're a medication man. No, no, no. Hold well, on. Tell us, I'm tell a doctor us what the, what's and a scientist maybe. But I think you should get things in perspective. And it's not people's fault that they are overweight. And diabetes isn't a condition of obesity. It's a condition of the beta cell in the pancreas not being able to produce enough insulin. And they've looked at the genes to see what's the genetic component of diabetes. And they've found about 27 different genes. And virtually none of them are related to obesity. They're all related to defects in the beta cell that secretes insulin. And they've done a study in the Steiner Hospital in, Den in uh, Denmark that was very recently published. And this was a 20-year study from one of the most famous diabetes hospitals. And they looked at a group of 150 patients, and half of them they allowed to be treated in the usual way by their general practitioners. And the other half, they intensively modified their lifestyle and their cholesterol and their blood sugars but they did not include diet because diet is a hopeless treatment. 90% of people who go on diets don't succeed. And of those 10% that do succeed, 90% of these regain their weight. Okay. So if you had a tablet that had that effectiveness, it wouldn't get through the Drugs Advisory Board. They'd say it's hopeless. Okay, there, are four the patients, there are four patients of for mine obesity is bariatric surgery. Okay, we'll, we'll let Dr. Ava respond to that. There are Thank four you. patients in this studio here who have either reversed or stopped the progression of type, their, their type 2 diabetes because they have lost substant, the substantial amount of weight. Can we see them? Where are and, Dr. Ava's uh, patients? We just see you here, okay? And, just you know, I'm not there. the only one. Professor Taylor, and you know, Professor Tomkin, how much in very interesting studies has been done in Newcastle and the Newcastle studies. I see this in my clinic on a daily basis, and this studio wouldn't be big big enough to fill all my patients who have either reversed or improved their condition hugely by weight loss. The whole thing is that education is what is the basis of weight loss maintenance. But is it sustainable? Isn't that the question that people, the, 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 this the, small, is a the small amount of people who manage to take the weight off then put it back Absolutely. on again? Absolutely, and this is where the whole thing is, goes to education and also to motivation. We are spending 1.3 billion on prescription drugs for treatment of type 2 diabetes symptoms, not the cause. I hear from my patients every day they go to a diabetic clinic and all what's happening is that they're given more prescription, more, more prescription, there are hardly no dietary advice. Sometimes they are thrown idea, lose some weight, but they are not given an idea and understanding that if they lost substantial amount of weight, they don't end up on insulin. The degeneration of the beta cells don't happen. If people have to pay for their own prescription drugs for type 2 diabetes care, they would think differently. There's a gentleman, John Dalton, who has saved the government almost 14,000 euros in the last four years because he has not been using insulin. Okay, sorry, yes, we'll, we'll just get a microphone to you. How much does he pay, Dr. Eva, 
to actually save Your question life. is how much, how much has he paid? Yes, Sorry? because Dr. Ava is not seeing the typical individual who has type 2 diabetes. What, who is All it? of the people who come to your door are already motivated to lose weight because they've already decided that they are going to spend money in order to get into this programme. If you look the, at the guidelines for the management of diabetes in the community, one of the first lines of treatment is education. And all structured education programmes put an emphasis on healthy eating and weight loss where it is possible, but it is not possible for everyone. So you're saying that the, the, the majority of people who get this diagnosis of type 2 won't be motivated to lose weight? The majority of people diagnosed with type 2 diabetes are from the deprived community where safety may be put above their health or where addiction may actually cloud their judgment. And these are the individuals that are clogging up the system. We need to be addressing the wider issues, not just talking about weight loss management programs that put people on 600 calorie diets and ask them to purchase smoothies and supplements to fulfill their healthy eating. Okay. Is that what you do? Yeah, Pat, on would you please tell your... <laughs> is that what you do, put people on 600 calories? 600, 800 calorie diets, which are based... This is the very low calorie diet, the same method that has been used in Newcastle by Professor Taylor. And which many basically people maintain that weight over, over a long no, For period. example, you have there now a patient, a gentleman who has, has kept seven stone off for the last five okay, years. Who, who John, uh, John Dalton. John Dalton. John, where are yes, you? I, I, over five years ago, I went to Dr. Ava and it was gross, morbidly obese was this term, I think the computer said. I was over 26 stone weight and she put me on her diet plan. Weight fell off of me wasn't four or five months on it. I, I was on a, a large dose of insulin, over 80 units a day, off the insulin completely since, and I've maintained the weight loss for the five years. Okay, so it's worked for you. Yeah. Carl Spain is sitting in front of you there. Carl, of course, you took part in Operation yes. Transformation. What do you think when you hear all of this, that the um, weight loss well, isn't I've sustainable? Actually, uh, I've, I, haven't been, I haven't paid a, Dr. Ava anything. I would agree with what she says. Um, the one thing on when I did Operation Transformation was it was the, the, the food plan. I would have been someone who would have tried to exercise into a healthy lifestyle over the years, lost significant weight, lost a stone or two, and then put it back on because I wasn't eating the right foods. Um, I'm into kind of week nine. Have you nine. stuck to the diet, by the way? Yes, I have, yeah. I'm into week nine now. Um, this morning I had a weigh-in, uh, another pound and a half off. Um, I'm nearly two stone in just over eight weeks. Um, the lesson I learned in the uh, Operation Transformation was it's, it's what you eat. Um, I'm exercising as well, but the exercise, but it's, 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 it's all what you eat. That was the one lesson I learned that I hadn't learned over the years. And the one thing I would say, whether um, teaching people how to cook is compulsory in schools or not, teach them more about food and about nutrition and teach the parents. And shows like this is great that people are going to be watching this. There's going to be some kids getting a rude morning when they're told... Your lunch tomorrow is not going to be what you thought it was. Um, you're not getting any money or whatever. But I think, I think this is good that the discussion is going on. Okay. But for me, it was definitely the lesson 80% is what you eat. And uh, the word diet, we were told, I was told not to use its food plan. And I'm certainly eating good portions, good healthy portions, three meals a day. But you're not I'm eating, eating what, you, what you used to eat. I'm feeling fantastic and it's all worked really well for me. Paul Kenny sitting beside you and Paul we met you in Operation Transformation yes. as well um, you didn't catch all of this in time you lost your leg people will, will know because they saw you on the show and your teeth as well yeah. what do you have to say about, about this debate we're hearing tonight that for some people, for many people going on a diet addressing lifestyle just doesn't work It works to a point for I think we're all after <coughs> excuse me, we're all after the same aim and that's to stop diabetes ruining people's lives. That's the main aim of the whole bloody thing. At the end of the day, <coughs> excuse me, I didn't look after myself, partly because I didn't know enough about it. Did you not know? Because you, cause you were drinking two two-litre bottles of Coke, Coke yeah. a day. Yeah. Did you I'd have not... one up, up beside the bed, one beside the sofa. I mean, that's... That's mad. I'm sure you realise now that's mad. Yeah. Did you know at the time that you were doing harm? No, not really. No idea? No. And I couldn't sleep at night. I'd be waking up two and three times a night to go to the loo. 
and you didn't make the link between the no, what you were consuming. No, not for about two these years. Are extreme but, cases, people. But, but if is, you, if you, the, if, 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 if that was a bit more expensive, Paul, i.e., if there was a sugar tax on it, yeah. would you still have consumed it? Okay, tax to me means nothing because it's like the motor tax is not used for motor to, for the roads or anything. So sugar tax. What are they going to use that for? More Irish water? Unless you ring fence something like that. Yeah, would it be ring fence, by the way? Because I know Leo Rutgers said he didn't... Unless you ring fence something like that, it's no good to anyone. I just want to hear the Minister on that. Will it be ring fence? The the plan is that we will set up a Healthy Ireland fund. And uh, I'm really hoping that we we, we don't have to wait for the introduction of the sugar sweetened drinks levy. Uh, So I'm I'm going to be waiting with bated breath to hear what Minister Noonan says tomorrow about it. Uh, What we want to use that Healthy Ireland for then is to support projects such as, for example, putting um, drinking water into schools. Uh, maybe if schools are encouraging children to cycle, that there'd be drying rooms for their coats. Practical projects okay. like that. Yeah, you are, you for local authorities that. for local authorities coming up with you know, adding cycling routes. Lots of free places for people okay. to exercise. What we want is for people we to be Kevin, well and healthy. Kevin McPartland is here. Kevin, where are you sitting? Kevin, yes. Uh, from the Irish Beverage Council. Don't like the sugar tax that's coming, I'd imagine. Well, no, and, and Dr. Avery is completely right. We know that this doesn't work. It's been tried in a number of countries. The uh, NCD risk, which is an international um, collaborative forum for public health officials, has found that it has never been found anywhere that it has been tried to reduce the consumption of sugar, to reduce BMI, or to reduce <laughs> obesity or diabetes, which is another subject you're concentrating give us on. A, well, give us a few, Bob, though, to use for the health promotion strategy that well, we heard about. Uh, well, if, if we're going to get into the situation now where we start having discriminatory taxes on particular types of food, where does that end? So if it starts on sugar sweetened drinks now, is it going to be cheese next? Is it going to be red meat? Is it going to be bread? Is it going to be cereal? You know, there is already VAT paid on all of these products. And, you know, to, to suggest that it's going to have any sort of impact on obesity is a fallacy. And anybody who has applied any sort of uh, reasons this knows that to be a fact. So it's, it's a stealth tax dressed up as a public health measure. OK, a stealth tax dressed up as a public health measure. I want to come to Kieran Fitzgerald, who's an agri-economist. Kieran, where are you sitting? I'm here. Kieran, your view. Yeah, I suppose uh, I, I'd agree with that. I mean, the, the point is that since 1985, we've had VAT applied on sugary drinks. So we've had 31 years of an experiment that would say we've had a tax on this product versus products like fruit and veg that are zero rated. And if, if, you know, if after 31 years, a tax of up to 23% hasn't created this better consumption pattern that people desire, then it's not going to suddenly do it now. I think the real concern is though, what it will do, and particularly uh, in the light of the weakness of sterling currently, is that people will buy these products either in the north of Ireland or in the UK, and we'll end up not just losing any new tax that may come in. I think people are, people are going to go to Northern Ireland to buy fizzy drinks. Absolutely. A few pence well, on it. People are, are already going to Northern Ireland to buy booze. All, all you need to do is put uh, fizzy drinks into the basket. We lost a billion quid in 2009 in revenue when sterling went to about 93 cents. Okay. It's a serious right. issue. So what we don't need we're to do is tax of, jobs. We're almost out of time. Uh, hey, Claire, we need yet. to go back to this diabetes yeah. thing because I, a patient of mine, John Murray, is there in the audience and he came to me in February and he has been diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. John, would you tell your story how they put you on drugs we're, straight we're away almost without out of no, time. John, no John, John, mention of... Can I come in on this? All right. We have our dietitian saying that it's all about uh, prevention. You're saying that if you change your lifestyle. No, I'm saying that what is that the first port of call for doctors is to give a prescription and all the but international not everybody. Guide- Do you not accept that but not everybody is motivated to lose weight? But international guidelines say that we should first look at the weight loss because weight loss, fa- fat in the middle, fat and food is the cause of type 2 diabetes. Okay. Why, why our, do, because there is enough evidence plan. that type 2 diabetes can be reversed. Okay. Unfortunately, uh, I have to leave it there, but we will come back to this. I know we have lots of people who want to get uh, involved in this story. If you have concerns about diabetes, you can go to your GP or there is a Diabetes Ireland helpline open open from 9 until 5 p.m. And the number is 1850-909-909. There's also a website, which is diabetes.ie. Now, a few weeks ago, we discussed car insurance costs on the programme and why premiums are going up so much. One in three drivers have seen their insurance go up by 50%.